starting uh, topic. So I, I think this is really about mechanism design, but by yeah. mech- maybe I have a little bit broader definition of mechanism design. So it's not financial incentives and then benefits that you get or, or something at stake that you can lose, but also social. If you start, if you create a new identity, that means that you're losing all your social connections and all the social reputation that you earned over time. Basically, you like you create a new Twitter account and you need to build up followership from, from scratch. Yeah, that's that's very much um, where my head's at with it. So yeah, so one of the things that we're imagining now is okay, there's these new organisations, and how does that make? How are they different to the real world organisations? And one of the main ones is that you can be a pudgy penguin in these things you can be a pseudonymous avatar rather than so that instantly changes the dynamic of an organization where normally you apply to enter there's a sort of rigorous process that decides whether you're capable or not to enter that organization and then once you're in you fall within the rule sets of that organization and how you have to perform in it so on and yeah whereas in DAOs you can be in a potentially a suit, completely pseudonymous account, an avatar, and then how you deal with that going forward. So one of these potential things is digital identity. So one of the things that we use something called, we call decentralized identity tokens, which is an NFT that can build up voting power in the DAO by doing various things. One of these NFTs acts as a voting ID, and then it can earn extra voting power by by doing whatever it is it's an open it's essentially it's an off-chain mechanism at that point so you can build social reputation inside the DAO so I guess what you're doing the mechanisms for proving that you are a designer or how, how do you validate the different things that people are doing how do you prove that people are what they say they are yeah so first of all I think that's an amazing idea and eventually we maybe want to get to some more meritocratic organizations where it's not your, where it's actually your contribution and your skills and your identity attributes, what matters when you do decision making. But even when you do different voting, sometimes if it's more tactical, some people maybe should have more weight to, to, to their vote, depending on areas of expertise. If it's a technical decision, then clearly engineers who have proven has proven skills can have more voting power, but I, I don't know. This, this is I, I, I guess you have much more uh, expertise in this topic, and, and we can get to it. But just to give an overview, so we're building a protocol, a professional identity protocol. It's a fully decentralized system based on ceramic network, so no backend. Everyone can create their identity for free. Everyone can get uh, credentials issued to them for free. So you can either get those credentials from existing web2 platforms like github or, or linkedin or dribble it can get, be issued by third-party applications built on top of the protocol and the first one we're building ourselves but also we're partnering with gitcoin and near protocol and one hive and block science and other DAOs that already have active communities and people work um, just doing a lot of work and this system will help them to issue those credentials and then have a little bit more clarity about their own communities and what people completed, what, what the, what's their experience. But also you can reuse this data across different DAOs. So if I did smart contract audit for DAO A and then for DAO B, when I go to DAO C or maybe apply for a grant or something like this, I can just prove the fact that I have this skill credential. I already completed similar projects, so that means I will probably do it fine a uh, third time around. That's just the simplest or the first use cases but the idea is really to have this decentralized linkedin protocol where it's fully open for any developer for any application and people fully control own their data interesting man yeah i think ksenia can you talk you yeah to... I, I have yeah. a question i have a question about that actually uh, because because we're using nfts as our ids and i'm just wondering if it's an nft does it make it uh, doesn't it make it inherently portable across other applications that are living on ethereum chain if it's an nft i can theoretically build a contract that interface with interface with interfaces with th- this particular nft so it makes it portable but maybe it's more complicated than that because i'm not 100 percent familiar with what ceramic is doing but i heard that there is some identity work being done there and yeah 
Is it, it's not NFTs, is it, Stefan, that you're talking about? It's more like an account, is that right? Yes. So there's a few different technologies and each one of those, it, it has some history and some reasons why it was developed. So the first one, the first basic building block is DID, Decentralized Identifier. And I think over time we will see a lot of use cases for that. And that's pretty very simple thing. It just allows you to abstract your identity, to rotate keys and to use same digital identity across multiple blockchains or even off-chain applications. So that's not part of the ceramic. That is actually W3C standard, and it's used quite actively in, in many use cases. And Spruce ID, for example, they are, I think they're doing most of the work when it comes to Web3, or most interesting work when it comes to applying DIDs to Web3. So for example, they developed this login with Ethereum standard. So how, how like, just a standard, how do you authorize users? Then the next step is uh, storage of the data. And I actually have a tweet a few days back about difference between NFTs and off-chain storage. And the main idea is with NFTs, you have a few problems. So first of all, it is, it is on-chain data, so you need to pay for gas. And second, it is public data, so you cannot hide it. Or at least you cannot hide the fact that you have it. And sometimes when I have a credential or like a document or skill or a co-op, maybe I don't want that to be public, at least not for everybody. Maybe I want to share it just directly with one DAO or one verifier or one employer. Decentralized addressable storage systems like IPFS, which is used beneath or under the hood in ceramic network, is a better fit because you can have a credential that has a signature of the issuer with their DID, so it can be very authenticity can be verified, but it's stored off chain and fully controlled by the user, by the customer. And me as a identity holder, I can decide who I share this credential with. And if I think that this is something that I want to be, to something that I want uh, to be completely public, I can just mint an NFT out of this credential. But I don't think it should be like you need to force mint NFTs to anyone before they explicitly want that to have. And also if you just design identity system for, let's say, voting, meritocratic voting, you also, you don't, I think you don't need on-chain identity or maybe I'm missing something, but I think it's not necessary. It makes yeah. really sense, the hiding credentials and or revealing credentials to people and entities who need to see them. It's, it makes complete sense to me. Yeah. And it's part of the kind of web of trust stuff from a lot of looking at this stuff a long time ago. The principle was, it's when you show your passport, when you, if you get ID'd buying alcohol, you show your passport to the guy behind the counter and you're showing him your, essentially your place of birth, your date of birth, loads of information about you when all they need is over 18. So the kind of thing of these things is like you have over 18 equals one. And then that's all you need to show to people. So yeah, I think there's the, to the point where do you need it for voting? I think at the moment, the paradigm in DAOs is one coin, one vote, which is, you just accumulate as much of the tokens as you want, and that represents your voting power in a DAO. And essentially, the decisions are made by what you could consider completely plutocratic power. And what if you look at DAOs like Compound, MakerDAO, you can see, you look at the decisions that are being made by there, and they actually the voting is controlled by about 10 to 15 accounts. There's normally a kind of little bit of the long tail comes in and votes. Most of them don't bother voting because they know their vote doesn't really contribute much to it. And so particularly in compounds, you can see the top five voters are like A16Z, Gauntlet, and a few other high value token stakeholders. And the value of this potential stuff is that you can now open up voting to something other than just plutocratic power. So if you bring in a kind of decentralized identity idea, then you can start to bring all sorts of reasons why you would listen to these other people in the DAO rather than just how much money they've got. So I think that's like a huge next evolution of DAOs. And I do think the decentralized identity piece plays a lot into that. So you might have a bunch of validated credentials, who like you validate a bunch of credentials for smart contract designers. We have a smart contract problem let's ask the smart contract people. Do you see where that, it's that kind of direction where it could go, Stefan, in terms of voting? Does that make sense, Steve? Yeah, totally. So if I understand this correctly, so we had these plutocratic systems just historically. I think Vitalik has a good article on this. I think his definition is 
every system that has possibility of collusion in it will eventually become a, a, a fin- I think he calls it financialized system, but basically yes. a system where people will accumulate resources and there will be a few people with majority of resources. And that's basically what we have in, in, in business or in, in politics or everywhere. And then we, uh, then we have some things like quadratic voting that just helps to a little bit, in my understanding, it helps to spread this influence a little bit or, or um, maybe reduce the power that, or maybe uh, it, it have more people to have a say in, in some decision. And then lastly, we have a system or we, we can have a system where it's not just tokens. It's not just how much stake or money you have, but it's also your uh, reputation, your contribution, your credentials, your social standing that also influences this. And then we can design all these interesting systems by combining uh, these building blocks. Or at least that's what I'd like to <laughs> to see in the future. Yeah, so that's actually what we're working on. So the big, so the, the kind of the way to smooth out plutocratic power. So what I, I would say you could say quadratic voting on its own. There's there's a few iterations of it. We've made one of them. But quadratic voting is this idea that you can have more votes, but you pay an exponentially large amount for each subsequent. If you vote five times, it costs you twenty five dollars, for example. If you vote a thousand times, it costs you a million dollars. So it's the square of the votes. And that kind of smooths out the impact of the millionaires. So if you've got $10 million, you can have a thousand and one votes. So we're using that kind of smooths out the plutocratic problem. But what we're doing is attaching them to NFTs. So I'm very convinced that NFT governance is going to be really big it's better it's better than the fungible token governance because you can have you can use them as governance tokens but then weight voting amounts for each nft individually and then you can whitelist certain nfts to do certain things in the dow and it gives you just a huge design space for how to to manage them so um, can, can, can i so i have a question yeah. here uh, yep. I, I think I understand. so what stops me from just accumulating all those nfts why this is not of the same plutocratic system if I can buy those. So yeah, there's um, we've developed a kind of auction system for issuing the NFTs. They're issued from what we call a continuous auction. So if let's say there are like ten dollars to buy an NFT, and then as people buy them, they come out in a sort of rolling auction. If you buy one for ten dollars, the next one is twenty dollars for a period of time, and then they decay back to 10 bucks. If someone buys the one at $20, it goes to $40. Someone buys the one at $40, it goes to $80, and it goes exponentially expensive. So civil attackers like that, in order to accumulate vote, voting power for our vote, will typically do that. They'll buy, they'll just buy a load of votes as and when they need them. So this puts up a kind of crypto economic firewall for people just buying a load of NFTs for a vote. But um, can I buy it after and on the secondary market? After individuals bought them, you can. So what again? It's a smoothing effect on the plutocratic power. So you can't, if unless you're doxing people. So unless you're taking people's identities and doing the whole credentialized thing, and and, and it's far few. We want to. There's like a design trajectory for maintaining complete pseudo pseudo anonymity without any credentialization, any hard identity, just maintaining the trust of an account without doing any of that stuff. And and the way that you do it is through essentially crypto economic mechanisms rather than you just have to make it very expensive to civil attack or very expensive to accumulate voting power. So yes, you can buy them off from the issuance mechanism or from the secondary market, which creates a sort of financialization of that voting power. You can't get away from that in pseudo, um, pseudonymous systems. Remember, uh, you can also buy voting power from real people that are credentialized. You can just pay them. Yeah. Yeah. So like bribing. Bribe, vote bribe. So, yeah, there's, it all ends up, there's no way that you can get away from money, certainly in groups of economic systems. But what you can do is make it, make it very costly for people to brute force the system. So we've got these systems. We, we've seen it 
happened live for about a year now. So we've had one of these auction mechanisms. They're fairly well distributed. And when they fall down to a sort of low price again, people do a sort of accumulate them up. And a lot of people are doing that to sell them on the secondary market, um, presuming there's going to be some demand for them in the future. But it's still orders of magnitudes better plutocratically speaking than just fungible tokens being the primary voting it also allows this kind of like social validation mechanisms to turn up so my avatar here is like fvt1 so my voting idea is like number one so people know that's me now and what we might be able to do is say okay we can like delegate more voting power to knit or we trust that this is actual and i could because we use quadratic voting, we actually use some modified quadratic voting or a version of it where every NFT gets a budget of voice credits. So you have a, a hundred voice credits to spend on stuff. So you get a list of stuff you can spend your priorities on. And then we can extend that budget of voice credits to bigger if we want. So let's say we trust FVT1 as a valid ID. We can start giving more voting power to to that account do you know what i mean so we can start to play with social validation processes on assigning voting power to nfts so it makes it more social rather than purely crypto economic yeah so this is yeah th this is amazing and is this limited to just voting or i'm thinking I, I, just one of the problems and one of the use cases uh really pain points that DAOs have is not even decision making especially in at early stages but open sourcing the uh, their processes so for example mm. if, if you have a corporation you can hire someone full-time they have a specific task to do but in DAO there's a lot of people who have different levels of commitments and different expectations and it's more chaotic in this sense but also but then can this system be used to organize to, to manage projects or to manage processes basically replace management that I, I think it so one of the one of the things that i think it has the potential to do is you've got these pseudonymous avatars nfts tokens that represent an entity in the dow and from that you can build up so you let's say you have these clusters of nfts who've done this stuff in the dow and they build up sort of reputation as actually have done that you can then whitelist specific NFTs from a larger set. So let's say you've got a thousand NFTs in a DAO. We can set up a what we call mini DAOs, where you can whitelist a subset of those NFTs to be a department almost. And now you can get now you're getting into the almost the management type things. It's like, okay, these this group of people have done all this design work. So let's create a design mini DAO. And you can whitelist those different NFTs to be in that cluster. And now you've got a group of people, pseudonymous people who've all done that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think it can go into that and remain completely pseudo anonymous. And when it crosses over with your work, I think it could be really interesting because you might be able to jump straight into the design mini DAO because you've done it elsewhere before. I think what it does is make cross DAO credentialization possible. Yeah, and, and also just judging from the value that... So a, a lot of DAOs today exist. The only feature that they have is voting, and, and that's fine. But a, a, as you said, there's a lot of problems with how it's designed. And a lot of decisions that are like proposals and unions for DAO are actually not... Uh, most of them are not important things. And the important things are still being decided internally uh, in, in the company. But, I, call it, uh, I call it DDoSing by bike shedding. <laughs> but then DAOs can can create much more value, not through decision making, but through delivering value, building products, doing services. I don't know, doing the same thing that corporations do, for example, but in this open source uh, manner. And that suddenly, if that is to happen, and if it turns out that it's actually more economically efficient to to create a DAO if you want to build a product, then 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 suddenly. We have, I think this is more on utopia side of, of things. Yes. Uh, because now anyone can come and contribute to whatever organization that they share a mission or a vision with and get compensated fairly. So it's just like more 
democratizing meritocracy or democratizing work workforce something like this and and this uh, yeah to enable this we have all the same problems we need decentralized identities we need a way to coordinate people we need a way to 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 still make decisions in a transparent and fair way but yeah so i'm trying to think beyond just proposals and beyond just voting yes absolutely but yeah we have we're very so the way i look at it is that the cost of organization the same way that the cryptocurrencies reduce the cost of transaction essentially across many different things it's the transaction costs are the linking between someone wants to sell a for c and then there's a routing thing between b cryptocurrency essentially by disintermediating and all reduces the transaction costs those reduce coordination costs so you can set up an organization they reduce to almost zero you can set up an organization for practically nothing now which means you can spin up organizations for anything like temporary organizations so let's say we're going to set up an organization to for this event we can set up a dao build an organization around it like a template organization do the events done wind down the dao it's done so the cost of coordination is going to drop to zero over time and that that just gets really exciting then because you can now start to organize for all sorts of things yeah so i think that's where it gets i want to add to this a little bit just i really love this idea and i think it's not just transaction costs it's also switching costs so for example yeah. switching from one company to another or from one organization to another today's very expensive month long process whereas in dao it becomes like just really switching a tab in this course and next one is so so transaction costs switching costs and also the composability so in defi for example defi is growing so fast because you don't need to build the full stack you just build on top of the existing protocols so we have uh, yeah, ethereum uniswap your finance and then i built some small thing on top of it and i can be a sole developer but delivering a lot of value because of all this stack and the same problem can happen to organizations as well so if i have let's say i don't know i designed a product management framework and i can just open source it and have people use it in their DAOs, or i have a i don't know smart contract auditing uh, project or framework or algorithm of how to do it and then any DAO can take this process and just basically fork it and have their contributors or their members to become part of this process. So today organizations, they are closed source and they need to reinvent all the processes from scratch. Of course, they're building it on their experience, but they still need to do it again every time. Whereas in DAOs, we like we can just yeah open source and reuse. And this is one of the main benefits, I think. This is why we're focused on DAO tooling. And I think people have got slightly, people's ideas are fully formed on what that means yet. But it's like the kind of thing you were, it's close to what you were talking about in my mind, which is you've got these organizational processes that can be then ab open source and abstracted. It's not as simple as building a decentralized calendar or something that everyone can use. Um, it's This is a workflow for how to manage decentralized people. And this is the app that does it, that can work across multiple DAOs it's like we've cracked this process that works and it's like with the first wave of DAOs will just figure out how to collaborate with lots of people all over the world and those processes almost get ossified into like smart contracts and just picked up and used by other people and I think that's where it's going to like really rapidly scale because hey we figured out how to do this and then 200 other DAOs start doing it immediately because it's open source. I have a question. I guess you guys are familiar with OVNs, right? The Open Value Networks. And the poster boy of OVNs is Sensorica. And I'm always wondering why, like, I seem to remember, like, people banging on about OVNs for years and it didn't really take off. I can't think of any other OVNs. And then DAOs essentially are OVNs. So what is the secret source then? And why did, is it just technology that is, as a secret source for, for, for it taking off or, or what? I don't know if too many people doing that OVNs. So the, no one, no, nobody's doing it. It's just theory. And there's one OVN was, I know of, it's called Sensorica. That's it. But DAOs just like growing like mushrooms. So yeah, they, they're essentially very similar. So it, what was missing was blockchains for me. And the idea of open source innovation is a huge one. And open source, 
open source sharing of knowledge and working in this kind of commons idea. And we've seen examples of how it can, you know, change the world, like Wikipedia, Linux, these kind of things, but they're very rare. It's almost like lightning in a bottle. And the re- and, and what's missing is the coordination. For me, what's missing is the social consensus. How do you decide what to do? Wikipedia is, let's just pool our knowledge. Linux was, we've got, and it was very, it's actually quite centralized. It's open source and it invites contributors, but the gating of it is very centralized, but it had a very specific mission focus. But DAOs have this kind of open up, open source idea. They can be anything. We can raise money to buy the constitution. We can raise money to launch NFTs, curate art, anything. So yeah, why are DAOs doing well? I'm not even sure they are yet. I think it's still super, super early. But what's happening is that people's ideas of what might be possible are huge. So it's like people's dreams are big. And the reality of it is is, it is very difficult. Yeah, I, I agree that it's still, yeah. 99% of the things we're discussing are super early. And I think we will be surprised to, in, in how it will actually turn out. But also, I think the answer to the question, like what is the secret sauce, is actually in the title. And it is uh, mechanism design. So blockchain mm-hmm. is, is a business model for open source. Or not, not blockchain as a technology, but crypto and Web3 invented business model for open source software. And I think the same business model can be applied not only for software, but for open source just work and, and, yep. and thinking and data and knowledge. So, for example, today I have zero, like maybe unless I'm a professor at university, I don't have any motivation to share practices that I discovered over last 10 years working in a certain industry. But if you are a DAO and you, for example, invented a really good process of reviewing grant proposals, and that's an actual real example of a problem that a lot of DAOs deal with. And uh, today, all of them invent their own process. But let's imagine, I don't know, Avi or Gitcoin, they just formalize this. They define, so for example, Deep Skills app that we're building, it's a real example. We work with Gitcoin, we help them to create some kind of taxonomy, basically create a project, which is reviewing grant proposal, then split this project into specific tasks. How do we do it? And then have this, project as a blueprint so any other DAO can fork and reuse it and if we are able to design a really stable tokenomics behind it that might scale so that new DAO instead of doing it from scratch they can fork existing project populate it with their own data maybe change some parameters and then have open slots in that project so their own contributors can join and do some work, like maybe summarize the proposal or reach out to to proposers and, yeah, just go through all of those steps. Yeah, and I think we're starting to see that. The, it's weird that the most, it, the market says the most successful DAO at the moment is Olympus DAO. And it's essentially a Ponzi scheme, but it's a Ponzi scheme that's been copied and forked. And it's got this mechanism design, it's got this economics paradigm. And it's mostly buy some tokens on the market, stake them, and you get loads more tokens once you're in. But you're starting to see this phenomenon of lots of parallel forks of it turning up. There's like a new Olympus style fork every day. And then people are starting to elaborate on it. And it shows you where this might go. We'll progress past the kind of Ponzi scheme. I called them like multiplayer money games earlier, which is, I think, the best, the kindest way. I can look on that stuff. But you can imagine this getting to the point where it's really productive. We've, we're, hey, we've, here's this DAO that's done this, that's a creative DAO. So I, I know Al's here, David's here in, in the crowd who are working on Stoner Cat's DAO and what they're doing at Big Head. And they've just named their DAO, what was it? Metawood, Metawood Studios. So that's going to be a DAO that creates content I'm using nfts as voting ids that creates content for real animation it's going to guide an animated studio to make content now you crack that and that's a working prototype and then everyone starts forking it and everyone starts copying that paradigm you can see how quickly that they can scale if it gets to the point where instead of 10 new ponzi's a day we get 10 new creative DAOs a day you can see how quickly this could start changing the world. I think Al's up there, actually. Do you want to expand a little bit on, on that, Al? See what you're doing there? Yeah. I can, man. Cool. Um, yeah, it's uh, going great. It, we're just building up on active members at the moment. And 
like overall the influence on a TV show is what we're building on. So we all have this love of characters in a TV show, human or cats, but like there is a human in it. But so we all love a character and around that then we all want to influence a TV show. So we get to do our quadratic voting and we're going to direct the, like, in conversation as well. So, like, there's a really interactive show where we're talking um, one-on-one with the creators. Sorry. And um, we're, yeah, so the quadratic voting then is going to direct the creators into what we want them to do. And at the moment, we're, like, just building, starting off. And active membership is the hardest thing I find at the moment to, like, to reward, to entice. That's, like, where we're looking at and researching. So, like, overall, the I think DAOs, they're, like, what we're going for is a slow, organic, really, what do you want your DAO to do is important. But why are you all here is more important. If I can get an active membership around a, a TV show and a love of character, much better than I can around making a money in one particular cryptocurrency or even like proper, not Ponzi schemes. But like, yes, that'd be nice. <laughs> and I think, I just, and, and that's why I love the kind of Stoner Cats example because it's harder because you've got to, in, and the engagement is everyone's, a lot of people in crypto, most people are in crypto are here to make money. And there's a slightly different dimension to DAOs, which is it, it's trying to capture people who are trying to be part of something a little bit more interesting than that. So, yeah, I'm just going to mute you there. Yeah, so it, I think there's, we're, we're right at this point where new idea, new patterns for DAOs turning up and they're not just little sort of money game, Ponzi scheme things. That's, and they're attracting billions of dollars and that's going to attract a lot of people who are interested in them. But I do think I would say DAOs are probably the most important technological idea that exists at the moment. And we're right at the very beginning of it. So it's going to be a super interesting time, I think. And anyone who's listening who wants to get involved in this stuff, join, just join any DAO. And I'm going to have to drop off in a minute because I have to meet someone. Everyone wants a DAO. All of a sudden, everyone's ringing me up and saying, Nick, I want a DAO. So I've got to go and meet someone and have lunch with some people who want a DAO. So I've got to do that in a few minutes. In fact, they're waiting for me. But yeah, join, get involved, join a DAO. We, you can see probably in our, see the host, finance.boat, that's us. Jump into our DAO. We will do this more often. I think this was super cool. Because then you're going to stay on and talk DAOs with people for a little bit longer. I'm actually up for wrapping it up and just keeping it under one hour. Yeah. If that's fine with every with everyone, I, I like I so. ke- keeping it concise because otherwise people end up rambling for ages and it's super interesting. But then everyone's tired in the end. That's I'd true. Ra- I, I'd, I'd keep rather it like people a, join a tight hour again. every week. Yeah, I'd rather people join next um, Wednesday again and we. we, we hopefully see the same people and can continue and elaborate a bit. Yeah. And Stefan, it's been absolutely wonderful talking to you. We should have a proper conversation about what your tech's doing. I I can imagine there being some synchronicity with what we're working on. Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot for organizing. And and yeah, I was completely random. I just opened my Twitter. Thanks Uh, for telling us. Yeah, that was great. It opened my eyes on DIDs a bit because uh, I didn't understand the, the obvious that uh, you pointed out with, with hiding credentials from different parties. So that was great. But yeah, let's, other things. let's do the same again next week. More down with strangers, 1 p.m. next Wednesday, UTC. I need to go and shield some more DAOs elsewhere now in the real world. So I'm going to jump off. But thanks very much, everyone, for coming along. It was fun. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks take man. care. Have a good one. Take, take care. See you in a bit. Bye.